Big Gator. Cute kid, a little messed up in the noggin, if you know what I mean. Lived alone in the swamp with the gators. Liked animals better than people, and she was always hooked up with some crazy tree-hugging group or another. But she could fight. Yes, sir, she could fight. Roy Old Payne shows up in the swamp one day, trying to break Allie's lease and getting her kicked off his land. But Allie wasn't in the mood for moving. On his end, Royal couldn't help getting that sinking feeling. Worried Royal Payne might come back, Allie decided she'd best pay off her lease. This meant seeing her deadbeat brother for some cash. Allie'd heard her brother had made it big in boxing, so off to LA she went. Though getting to the airport was a challenge. A major challenge. Well, LA's a tough town. Tougher than Allie could have guessed. Just picking up your luggage can cause a communication breakdown. Not that Jackpot was known for his verbal skills. Well, then again, neither was Allie. Allie looked up her brother's girlfriend, this rich aerobics instructor. Sadly, she was now her brother's ex-girlfriend and she was holding a grudge. Allie didn't like her comments and showed her some instructional techniques of her own. Turns out her brother was across town training. When Allie got there, she found out it was boxers only. Thinking she could handle it, Allie signed up. But before she could find him, she was called to fight. When Allie finally got her chance to talk to her brother, Kid USA, it wasn't exactly the reunion she'd hoped for. Because in the end, Jackpot's show was nothing more than a three-ring circus. And all Allie needed was the ring. Finally, the reunion she'd hoped for plus a new career as a pro fighter. You can't ask for more than that. What can I say about Bront? A criminal, a thug, violent as hell, always looking for a fight. The man has absolutely no concept of right and wrong. In other words, the perfect boxer. Unfortunately, he spent as much time in prison as he did in the ring. By rights, Bronto should have been locked up and the key thrown away. The thing was, there wasn't a joint that could hold him. Every once in a while, he'd decide he'd had enough and bust out. His last attempt would have been successful, were it not for one major problem. Bronto was free, for now, but the heat would stay on. He had to get some cash and get out of town. Fast. He figured Mickey could help him, and sure enough, he had a job for him. A simple pickup and delivery. But this package was damaged goods. Pleased with Brano as usual, Mickey had some easier work for him. Fighting. He set up Brano with a cash fight. There was one catch. Brano had to win by a KO in the third, or Mickey lost his bet. But this guy was ready to rock and roll. Bruno had hung around town long enough and decided it was time to get out of the country. Mickey sent him to a place where he could get the papers he needed. But to get in, he'd have to design the security system first. All he needed was the right combination. Set up with his papers, Bruno was ready to go. All he needed now was a set of wheels and he was home free. Right in the wind, master of his future, a free spirit at least. What a moron. Safely over the Mexican border, Bruno was broke and had to find some work. For a criminal scumbag like him, that meant stealing something. Stealing was the easy part. The getaway 
would be a lot harder. Bronto liberated the town jail and became King of Criminalis or something. Under his rule, the town became a cesspool for low lives of all walks. Finally, a place he could call home. A hard as nails military tough guy. A major didn't take crap from anyone. I used to love to watch this guy fight. Nothing fancy, just an old school ass whooping. A thing of beauty. The major was in charge of hand to hand combat training. After knocking a few smart island recruits to the mat, they planned a little revenge. They hired a ringer as a new recruit and took bets that she'd clean the Major's clock. One time, the Major's recruits ended up at Mickey's bar. They got a little plastered and cocky and decided to take another stab at getting even. They called the base about a phony bar brawl and bet on the Major bailing them out. If the Major didn't deal with these AWOLs ASAP, he would find himself M.I.A. The Major was in a heap of trouble, off base after hours and fighting in public. But his boss made him a deal. Fight in uniform to help the recruiting effort and all would be forgiven. He'd better not lose, though. That would be a disgrace to the outfit and put his rank in jeopardy. The Major joined a promo tour of fighters, a bunch of real pros. He was in the process of suiting up for his next bout and didn't count on company. Let's just say that someone got an unauthorized glimpse of the Major's privates. <laughs> on the way to the next fight, the Major's tour bus got into an accident. Looking for a ride, he found an old heap in a nearby scrapyard. But for a criminal on the run, good hiding places are hard to find. These guys were going nowhere. Fast. After all his success on the tour, the Major was given a shot at the reigning champ. The General called to let him know that if he pulled this one off, he'd be welcomed back to his old job. It wouldn't be easy, though. Word on the street was that the champ used loaded gloves. The Major was rewarded for his gallantry with a promotion and a pat on the back from Uncle Sam. Everyone was happy to see him back. Everyone, that is, except his recruits. Holly Vixen, tough as hell, into leather bikes and vines. Tell me. What's not to love? Man, she was my kind of broad. <sighs> anyway, this one time she went back home to help out her old man. He was messed up in some shady deal gone south and had to spend a few weeks in the hospital. Holly stepped in to run his garage until he was back on his feet. Should've been easy, but nothing ever is. It ain't easy being a skirt and running a garage. There's a lot of guys out there figure a woman's place in the cars in the back seat. You just have to be patient, smile pretty, and be polite. Remember, the customer's always right. That's how Holly always dealt with it. One time, Jackpot stopped by for a little midnight visit. Seems Holly's old man owed him some cash, so he figured he'd help himself while the garage was empty. He didn't count on Holly being there. While going through the shop's books, one deadbeat's name kept popping up, Allie Gator. She owed Holly's dad a ton of cash and wasn't gonna pay it up. Maybe a friendly visit from Holly would help. After that night in the swamp, 
All Holly wanted was a shot of bourbon and a good night's sleep. She already had the bourbon, but she wasn't gonna get much sleep. The garage used to belong to Bronto before he was pinched. Holly's dad bought the shop from the county after Bronto was sent up. But he was out of the joint now. And he wanted his shop back. It was a rough night, and it didn't end there. Holly had just finished kicking Bronto's butt all over the shop when Royal Payne showed up trying to buy the garage. Seems like it was on a prime spot for condos. But it wasn't about the money. Holly had made a promise to her dad and planned to keep it. Royal wasn't the kind of guy to take no for an answer. And Holly wasn't in the mood to be polite. Things were quiet for a few days after that, and Holly figured that the worst was over. She couldn't have been more wrong. Bronto, bitter about the butt whoop and Holly gave him, came back to settle the score. Only this time, he brought a few buddies. When Holly's dad finally got out of the hospital, he found she kept her promise. But now she had to be true to herself. She got on her bike and rode on to success in her pro boxing career. Jackpot! A true heavyweight in every sense of the word. A big man with a hefty appetite. Strangely enough, it was his love of the grub that led him to boxing. He was broke and hungry and unemployed. A lot of us started out that way. The business world is not exactly desperate for fat, lazy guys. Although it seems that way sometimes. Jackpot's job opportunities were practically zilch, and that spelled it out pretty clear for him. No cash, no food. So he ended up where you might have expected, kicking ass for cash at Mickey's. Mickey was so impressed by Jackpot's victory, he lined up another fight for him. He even bet on Jackpot to win. If he could keep the pudgy bastard from eating himself into a coma, he might just make some decent cash. Even sick as a dog, Jackpot somehow managed to get the job done. He took his winnings and bought himself a diner, called it Heavyweight Burgers, and put a boxing ring in the alley behind it. Royal Payne, however, had other plans. He needed that land to finish his new casino. And what Royal wanted, Royal got. One way or another. Heavyweight Burgers was a hit, and people were lined up around the block to get in. Unfortunately for Jackpot, a certain rebellious vegetarian showed up and got in the way. He had to deal with the tree-hugging alligator if he wanted to stay in business. Even though his restaurant was busy as hell, Jackpot was eating all of the profits. If he wanted to keep the doors open, he'd need to find some cash. And quick. Cash from this win would help for now. But if Jackpot wanted to keep his diner open, he'd need a more permanent solution. And his agent just might have found one. If Jackpot could eat a ton of food and then win a fight, there might be a big money TV contract for him. Jackpot's blend of violence and gluttony was the ultimate American TV show. People would tune in by the millions to watch Jackpot stuff himself and then beat the crap out of someone. 
His place in both boxing and television history was guaranteed. Sure, Janet was a bubbly airhead, a spoiled rich girl who only thought about herself. But hey, nobody's perfect. She was also mean and sneaky and vicious. In other words, one hell of a fighter. Not to mention that killer body. Damn. All Janet cared about was looking good, and trust me, she did. So there was no way she was taking any chances that day at the Miss Tough Girl Beauty Contest. In the world of beauty pageant sabotage, one size does not fit all. Like I said before, Janet didn't give a damn about anyone but Janet. If she was in a hurry, look out. When she caused trouble, and she often did that, she'd just bat her out as she smiled pretty and played with someone else. Ah, girls will be girls. As much as Janet loved herself, which was a lot, the one thing that made her feel even better about her looks was to make fun of someone else. When the tides are turned, this girl's quick to kick. Ass. There was nothing Janet liked better than being the center of attention. Royal's dating game show provided both herself and Maya the opportunity to cash in. Among Janet's more admirable qualities was her generosity in defeat. Right. Janet isn't exactly what you might call empathetic. Basically, she just doesn't give a damn about anyone. Like the time she used Jackpot's picture in a promo ad without his permission. Jackpot figured a little fresh air might clear her senses. If you piss off enough people, eventually they're gonna want some payback. Janet pissed off pretty much everyone she'd ever met. Sooner or later, the payback was gonna be big. In this girl's case, more likely than After beating all of those fighters, Janet became a celebrity. Her method of combat aerobics swept the nation and became the latest health fad. She was on top of the world and loving it. King Khan. This Asian powerhouse was something out of Mongolia or something, I don't know. Never had much to say except with his fists, and they spoke loud and clear. Apparently, Khan was the son of some big shot tribal chieftain back home. To become the ruler of his tribe, he had to pass a series of tests. The first test was endurance. Khan's next test was about strength. The way I understood it, they got the biggest, toughest fighter they could. And not only did Khan have to win, but he had to knock the guy out. Tough try. In his next challenge, Khan had to learn her strength. Not easy for any fighter. He had to win the fight by decision without knocking the guy down at all. Now where's the fun in that? Man, they don't make it easy for a guy to run a village over there. Now, Khan had to beat another fighter, this time without throwing a single punch for three rounds. I couldn't do that. I don't know too many fighters that could. But the fun wasn't over for Khan just yet. It wasn't enough that he could kick ass. He had to kick ass with precision. His next fight, he didn't even have to win. He had to make sure he pushed all the right buttons, though. There was one test left, but it was a nasty one. Khan would have to show them that he laughed at pain, no matter how brutal. For this trial, his opponent's gloves would be customized for some serious damage. That was it. Khan was the new boss of the village. I hear it turned out to be a great gig with power, respect, and all. Too bad he ain't fighting anymore.
He was definitely world-class champ material. But his legend lives on. Kid USA. Bit of a cocky pretty boy for my taste, but turned out to be a damn good fighter. Although he didn't start out that way, he actually fancied himself a football player. But the boxing gods had other plans. It just so happened the Major Flack showed up and needed a favor. The Major was there to fight in a charity boxing match, only his opponent was a no-show and he needed a stand-in. The kid was much for helping others, but when the Major mentioned the potential for a little fame and fortune, now that was different. So the kid had some natural fighting ability, but his first day on the job wasn't over yet. El Luchador was late, but he got there just in time for the bell. The kid was on a winning streak. He finally had a shot at the champ. All he needed now was a kick-ass mentor. Someone who could take him to the next level. But Old Master, however, didn't think the kid was the one. The kid was a natural. All that pent-up energy had to come out sometime. He may have been young and undisciplined, but now he had himself a serious trainer. He just needed a sparring partner that could keep up with him. His success would be virtually assured. The kid was almost ready for the next big fight. But something wasn't right. Something was missing. Something that was real close to him. That special touch. That star-spangled fit. As soon as the fight was over, Old Master dropped the kid as his trainee and challenged him for the title. All the kid needed was a little Shaolin motivation. Well, it was hard work, but the kid got all the fame, fortune, and chicks he could handle. El Luchador. This guy was totally freaking nuts. Thought he was some kind of superhero or something. An amazing fighter, though. I guess when you get your ass kicked as much as this kid did growing up, you learn to protect yourself. Royal Pain rolled into Luchador's village. He had some big plans for the land, as usual. El Luchador obviously wasn't going to stand for that and told Royal to beat it. Only Royal don't give up that easy, unless he's got a rent a -thug handy. El Luchador made quick work of Royal's goon, and a few extra shots to the moron's head knocked some information loose. Seems Royal had planned to have another thug dye the town's water supply green. The villagers would panic, thinking the water had gone bad. Luchador would save the day, but not without paying a terrible price. Royal's next plan was to mess with El Luchador's rep. Without the town's support, Luchador would be nothing. He had Bronto wear a mask like El Luchador's and sent him to rob the town bank. El Luchador would have a hard time foiling Royal from behind bars. After proving his innocence, El Luchador was so popular he got to star in a movie about his life. The director loved it. Thinking that his troubles with Royal were over, a luchador went back to work as the village guardian. But Royal hadn't given up. If he couldn't beat El Luchador one-on-one, -on -one, 
he'd have to even the odds somehow. And as usual, he had an evil plot ready to go. <laughs> Royal had one last dirty trick up his sleeve. He planned to break into the town hall, doctor the records, and then claim he owned the entire village. A luchador was there to foil his plans, proving once again that crime does not pay. Everyone. El Luchador cemented his place as a true hero of his people. And Royal found out what the inside of a Mexican prison feels like. Ouch. An up and coming martial artist, Maya Garu had come to Old Master seeking the training to take her skills to the next level. She didn't realize that Old Master had certain old world ideas about women. Lucky for her, she was a pretty tough broad. Old Master wasn't too keen on training a woman to fight, but she seemed tough enough and she had the cash, so he figured, what the hell? Plus, she paid in advance, so if he could get it to quit, all the better. Well, Maya got past her first fight in the first day of training, but it wouldn't get any easier the next day. Old Master had more devious plans in store for that hard head of hers. I told you Maya was tough. But Old Master was a conniving old coot. He'd do anything to get rid of her. Things just got ugly. Fat and ugly. <laughs> and so our training continued. The harder Old Master made things, the more stubborn she got. She wasn't about to give up. So the old man had better watch his... Maya was getting real tired of Old Master's training techniques, but she was getting tougher. And soon, she wouldn't have to put up with any more of his crap. Or anybody else's, for that matter. Maya knew the Old Master was trying to get rid of her, but now she was tough enough to do something about it. Since she'd completed her training, only one, wait a minute. No, that's right, only one challenge remained. By defeating Old Master, Maya had won the right to be the new master of the dojo. The Old Master left, bitter and broken. Cheesy Spanish weasel with an eye for the ladies. He wasn't the kind of guy you'd catch me watching the game with, but I wouldn't want to mess with him either. Underneath that fancy accent and those shiny outfits was one hell of a fighter. And that's no bull. It doesn't take much to make a hothead like Matador jealous. So when he saw his woman Dolcita eyeball and tie his boxing poster, he figured he'd better get in shape and fast. The next bullfighter, he decided he'd take a few boxing lessons from the local champ, Tiny. His first lesson would be unforgettable. Well, he was tough enough, so Tiny took him on as a pupil. Tiny told him that the very first thing every great fighter needs is a signature move. And the best moves come from something you do well. So it was that Matador's killer move, the Spiked Ole, was born. After Tiny's intensive training sessions, Matador figured he could use a little rest and relaxation. He was having a great time until El Luchador yeah. ran into him. Matador snapped and tempers flared. These two were in for a bumpy ride. This being a fighter was hard work. Every time Matador turned around, there was another ass to kick. But it turns out Khan had been nosing around his woman for too long. When he saw that look in Dolce's eyes, 
he decided he'd give Khan a sound thrashing. Well, at least that was the plan. He took care of Khan. Now it was on to a real pro, Kid USA. If Matador won this match, Dolcito would be his for sure. Or so he thought. With brides like her, you just never know. Well, he won the fight and got the girl. But after all the crap she put him through, he didn't want her anymore. The little Dolcita didn't take rejection too well. Enter Bronto. Looks like this chick beat Matador to the punch. It wasn't easy, but things worked out okay for Matador. He had a hell of a career in front of him, and he finally got rid of that two-timer Dolcita. All through the magic of boxing. Mickey McFist. Now there was one tough pug. Loved the ladies and the booze, not to mention the ponies. A great fighter. Not such a great gambler. Wish I'd bet the opposite of every bet Mickey made. Heck, I'd be a freaking billionaire today. Anyway, that's where his trouble started. Too many bets, too many losses. He was in deep to the local loan shark and getting behind on the vig. Something you never want to do. One day, Mickey's working away at the bar when Bronto shows up. He politely asks Mickey for that week's loan payment. Mickey's a tad short, but Bronto understands and gives him an extra day. These two go way back. You'd think Mickey would have handed the cash over to Bronto. Instead, the moron invested it. Maybe Bronto would have taken that car as a payment, but Mickey decided to do a little body work to it first. Anyhow, Bronto let him slide on the vig for another day, but not before making sure his buddy Mickey was all right. Mickey finally made the payment, but he was late, and that meant an extra charge to work off. Bronto's boss had bet on Mickey to win in the third round and buy a KO, and if Mickey was smart, that's what he'd do. Notice I said, if. Thinking the loan shark would have had the fight fixed, Mickey bet everything he had on himself. A sure thing, right? Well, he was right about the fix. Just before the fight, Bronto had some new orders for him. Lose. Screwing the loan shark's fix wasn't the smartest move. Like you'd figure, Bronto had some new demands. Mickey'd bet his bar against the loan shark's losses, or he'd buy it cheap after Mickey's funeral. Of course, Bronto was gonna make damn sure Mickey was in no shape to win. Mickey figured he'd saved his bar and paid his debt. But scumbag loan sharks don't like to lose, and this one was no different. Bronto was sent in to make sure Mickey didn't leave that ring in one piece. Bronto walked in the next day with some good news for a change. The loan shark bet on Mickey to beat Bronto and won back all his losses. Mickey was free and clear. Like most things that happened to Mickey, this called for a drink. Like I said, these two go way back. Knuckles Nadine, one of the toughest broads to ever hit the ring and damn hot looking too. Before becoming a pro boxer, she wasted her time in the rodeo of all things. Well, you know what they say, you can take the girl out of the trailer park, but... Every time Nadine won at the rodeo, which was a lot, she sang her victory song. She was completely talentless, but had a great set of lungs, if you know what I mean. So the guys encourage her. Not everyone was a fan, of course. It was time for a career change. So she fired a rodeo agent and started down the path to music stardom. 
As country music was her thing, her lack of talent wasn't an obstacle. Unfortunately, Nadine's rodeo agent wasn't as excited about her plans to quit as she was. He sent the matador over to change her mind. Now that she was free of her agent, she could start working on her singing career. The first step was to start practicing day and night. Everyone likes music, right? Don't complain. Nadine knew that to get a record deal, she'd need to impress someone at the top. Trailer park etiquette didn't require that she make an appointment. Next thing Nadine figured she needed was some exposure. And since the odds of Nadine getting her own show were even lower than her IQ, she had to come up with another plan. Nadine heard about a big talent contest with a fat record deal as first prize. And this was her chance to break into the big leagues. No talent, no brains, and a big rack. The classic recipe for country music success. If you're into loud, bitter, big bone babes, then a diva is your dream come true. The lady's got a thing for opera if you can believe it. Man, what a shrew. But I gotta admit, she could fight. And with a vile disposition, she got a lot of opportunity to. This one time, the diver was sharing the stage with Pharaoh. Well, as much as she shared anything, which wasn't a whole lot. She started wheeling some kind of song. The thing is, the play was no musical. The whole deal drove Pharaoh nuts, and he decided to pull a few strings to shut her up. Well, that was it for a diver's singing career. She'd burned her last bridge. Now she needed some cash, but more importantly, she needed some fans. The diver wasn't the first down and out loser to slither into Mickey's looking for fame and fortune. And though Mickey wasn't too keen on giving an unknown fighter a shot, she sweet-talked him into giving her a test fight. The diver realized that it wasn't singing that she loved, it was the applause, the roar of the crowd. And the crowd was a hell of a lot more enthusiastic when she was beating the crap out of someone than when she was singing. She was hooked. A few nights later, a diver's practice session was, shall we say, interrupted. It seems her fight with Pharaoh had cost some producer a load of cash. Cash he wanted back. Brano was sent over to milk the cow, if you know what I mean. I remember a diver's first major bout. She was up against El Luchador, one serious muchacho. Problem was, he refused to fight what he called a fragile woman. Well, Diva sure cleared that up in a hurry. The Diva's at this fancy play one night, and guess who the star was? Yep, her old pal Pharaoh. Well, the old lady snaps and decides to go for a little payback. Lucky for Pharaoh, she wasn't looking to do some serious damage, just enough to trip him up a little. <laughs> she was one class act. Go figure. The morons in the crowd thought it was all part of the show, and they loved it. A diver was back where she belonged, entertaining a bunch of chumps with more money than brains. Well, that's the theater for you. A disciple of the martial arts, the old master was an elderly trickster on top of the game. With no bribes or booze or gambling in that temple he grew up in, no wonder he trained all the time. 
What else was he going to do? After decades of living like hermits, the monks at the old master's temple decided to hook up the internet. Well, once the old master got a glimpse of what the world had to offer, he was out of there and off to America to find fame and fortune. Maya Garu begged him to take her along. When that didn't work out, she decided to take things into her own hands. While hiking through the mountains on their way to America, Old Master and Maya Garu were stopped by King Khan. No one was going to pass through his lands without permission. So a heavy negotiation ensued. <laughs> Definitely a Kung Fu classic moment. Old Master had never been on a plane before and overdid it on the complimentary cocktails. The next thing he knew, he was in La La Land and about to be welcomed by Bronto's special brand of initiation. Old Master did whatever it took. Rides, dives, shady deals. It was all the same. He cheated his way into Vegas and in no time he had a shot at a title bout with the number one contender. He was finally getting the respect he deserved. After sucking his hotel minibar dry, Old Master fell asleep again and ended up in another nasty nightmare. Man, this guy should just lay off the sauce. Well, this was it. A big fight. If he pulled this off, he'd have the fame and fortune he came for. But the combination of a wicked hangover, no sleep, and the gigantic bruiser Tiny waiting to knock his freaking head off weren't gonna make this a walk in the park. After winning the championship, Old Master decided he'd return to a more traditional lifestyle. But what's life without brides, booze, and gambling? If ever there was a pompous, self-centered wannabe who fancied himself some kind of actor, that would be Pharaoh. Now don't let the name fool you, he was anything but Egyptian. Deep down though, he had the stifled rage that all the great ones had. And when he let it loose, damn. All Pharaoh cared about was acting. Anything that messed with his craft was in serious trouble. So when he was forced to share the stage with the diver, he went totally freaking nuts. Fired from his job at the theater, Pharaoh had to find a gig that would pay the bills. After weeks of searching, he finally got a tip on some work. Jackpot had a job for him, but it wasn't what he had in mind. The big guy figured he'd warm up to the idea. But a burger joint's no place for a ham. After his fight with the diver, it was tough for Pharaoh to land any real acting gigs. But after his experience with Jackpot, he insisted his agent find him some serious theater work. He'd regret that decision. Arrogant actors and low-budget commercials ain't never gonna mix. decided it was time to work on his own material. Crap material, sure, but at least it was his. He opened his one-man show at a well-lit spot with lots of seating. It was about as far off Broadway as you could possibly get. But it wasn't far enough for his groupies. Beating Tiny to a bloody pulp gave Pharaoh so much press, he was finally able to land a role in a serious play. But Pharaoh still owed the theater owner for the damage his fight with the diver caused. He was trying to weasel his way out of that mess, but denial is more than just a river in Egypt. Finally back on top again, 
Farrell was set to take the acting world by storm. But there was a big, fat, ugly surprise lurking in the crowd. Lucky for Pharaoh, the crowd was made up of pompous morons who thought it was all part of some new age artsy fartsy thing. And they were definitely a hit. Well, kinda. They are the strongest, fastest, most ruthless fighters the world has ever seen. Drawn to the thrill of raw combat, they've sworn to challenge any contender, in any arena, at any time. Theirs is a story of love, of tragedy, and of triumph. For these urban gladiators, there can only be one champion one way in or out of the ring, and that's black and bruised. Coming from the streets of London, Royal Payne boxed his way to the top. Once there, he was snooty enough to be considered royalty. A good fighter doesn't mean you're good at business, and Royal soon found himself back on the streets. But he vowed to get it all back, to get it back the way he got it, by fighting. Royal hadn't seen Mickey in at least 10 years, and their last meeting wasn't what anybody would call friendly. But strange times made for strange friends. <laughs> Royal needed money, badly, so back to Mickey's he went. Of course, Mickey's wasn't what it used to be, either. Disappointed with the small amount of cash Mickey's fight paid, Royal decided to do what he does best, swindle people. He started with Ali Gator, who happened to be renting some valuable land. Ali was only too willing to let Royal get to the bottom of it. Next, Royal was off to a small Mexican village he'd been buying up. Royal decided it was time to evict the locals and do a little renovating. What he didn't know was that this village had a guardian angel, a real traditional kind of guy. After finishing in Mexico, Royal moved to Las Vegas. His new casino was being held up by some diner that was in the way. Well, Royal always had a plan. Not always a good plan, but a plan nonetheless. In the diner's rubble, Royal found an old treasure map. The map might have been a fake, but once Royal got to Mongolia, he had a whole new plan. Sadly, after Mexico, one of the locals decided to put a stop to Royal permanently. Well, he certainly didn't deserve it, but Royal was rich again. He bought his old house back and moved back to England. But as they say, you can run from your problems, but eventually, eventually they come running back. Royal was back on top through lying, cheating, swindling, and fighting. Everything a true boxer loves. Boxers don't get a lot tougher than Tiny. A lumberjack from the rugged Canadian North, Tiny was known for his brute strength. They say he could rip a tree from the ground with his bare hands. But after seeing him lay down a few beatings, I believe it. Tiny loved his work. There was nothing that gave him the satisfaction he got from tearing down every tree he could find. Every once in a while, some nature freaks would show up and try to stop him. But uprooting the people's plans was right up Tiny's alley. 
One day, Tiny found himself in Mickey's spa. This time, instead of ignoring the fat posters, he actually read them. Smashing a few heads seemed a lot easier than knocking down trees, so Tiny figured he'd sign up. Contract-wise, Mickey'd have him knock out a few points first. As Tiny suspected, getting paid to beat on someone was even better than doing it for free. A pushy boxing agent happened to be in the gym that day with a deal Tiny could not refuse. All he had to do was knock out another of the agent's fighters and just like that, he'd be a pro. Tiny was apprehensive, that is, until he read the bottom line. He was in the big leagues now, but professional boxing is not exactly what you'd call honest. It's more like what you'd call completely corrupt. If Tiny expected a fair fight, was he ever wrong? The fix was in, and it wasn't for Tiny. Tiny kept on fighting and kept on winning, earning himself a shot at the champ. Nervous about his title fight, Tiny decided to cruise the strip and maybe grab a bite to eat. He ended up at Jackpot's. But his opinion of the food was less than complimentary. Well, this was it. Just one fighter separated Tiny from the championship belt. And Tiny was ready for it. But not for that cheap shot. Ah, Vegas doesn't get any nastier. Damn, I love it. Tiny made the grade. He won the championship and found a new home in the lap of luxury. <laughs> 